Let's see what our panelists for today's discussion have to say about creativity in a logical world. So today's panelists, we have uh, Dick Van Mottman. Uh, he's a founder of Unventures. Uh, he's an advertising man at art who now helps businesses and people find value over form in the adaptive economy. So he's getting people prepped for the next step. Um, his company provides investment, incubation, advisory, and consultancy to help unlock and unleash potential. He's a former worldwide CEO of Dentsu Creative Content Division, and he's the first non-Japanese head for Dentsu Asia. Uh, welcome, Dick. Thank you, Akana. Thank you for having me. We also have uh, Michelle Chan, who's a student. Uh, Michelle initially wanted to be a doctor, and uh, after passing the required uh, getting the good grades to qualify, she then switched over to business administration instead. Uh, so <laughs> she's still trying to find her way in this world. She's young, so that's okay. She has also started dabbling in art, um, which has been an integral part of her life, I think. Uh, welcome, Michelle. Hi, thanks everyone for having me here. I'm super excited. Yeah. yeah. Great. And uh, we have... Uh, Art Fazil, singer, songwriter, well-known personality. Uh, he's a prolific composer who has penned songs with some of the leaders of the local music scene. Uh, artists like Ramli Sarib, Ella, Left Handed, and uh, Katija Ibrahim. Uh, his songs have won several awards and his success has resulted in him sharing his knowledge and experience through curated exhibitions and papers on the role of music and language. Uh, he's a founding member of uh, Raushan Fikir, a folk trio that the presented uh, alternative ethno-folk rock pop. That's a good combination of real <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, and, and, but he, he, he adds to that socially uh, conscious lyrics. Ah, you've, you've had a fair go at that, right? Uh, so maybe a few uh, examples from you might be good to set the tone in terms of what you think is that uh, dynamic between creativity and logic. Well, well, you know, creat creativity obviously it's it it's uh, it depends on the elusive um, muse inspiration, you know, very abstract, organic thing, right? And then and then in the logical world right now that we live in, we are especially in music, um, anything that is on online, it we are at the mercy of algorithms so that's the the logical world in a sense you know like how do you work with maths and the numbers and computers that doesn't have any feelings but depend on clicks and views and and how do you how do you justify whether it's a you know like especially like instagram followers like you could you could you could be you could have a million followers because you're cute but in terms of talent, maybe you could be lacking in that. But I know people in, in, in the acting world right now, in, I mean, locally and also regionally, where their jobs, depending on how many number of followers you've got on your Instagram, you know? And I mean, if, if this was like 20, 30 years ago, if somebody said, you know, how, much is, how many fan mails have you got a month I don't think people can can justify their talent based on just that alone, but now you know it's is that you know so you have, you have on on one hand the, the artists are still working within the old model which is basically creative input, inspiration and trying to con make connections between human to human, things that you cannot really quantify by by just digits. At the same time, the output is being measured by algorithms. You know, so and that, and as we know, algorithms can be manipulated if you have a big budget to to pay. You know, and Michelle, as part of the younger generation that's into Instagram and so many other uh, social media platforms, uh, how do you view this? Do you think 
uh, it's an accurate perspective of creativity. I feel that logic and creativity shouldn't be um, separated. I feel that they go hand in hand. So from my point of view, logic is the understanding of patterns, the understanding of rules and the understanding of boundaries. So maybe I, I've learned that through uh, growing up in Singapore and we have this um, uh, science heavy uh, education system. So you learn the rules of many things. But I feel that the creativity comes in when you understand these rules and boundaries so well that you know where are the grey areas that you can dance in. And I think that creativity in my world or in, in my generation is the ability to take examples that you have seen uh, and ideas that you have seen many, many times before and um, adapt them to your situation. So for example, if you're an influencer and you look cute, then you and if you are able to exploit that to your uh, benefit and you're able to make a living out of it then it's creative in your own sense yeah okay so you you see a balance between the two right um so dick um you've got overview on this having come from the advertising world and understanding the changes that have shaped how uh, consumers view uh, products through the advertising uh, elements what do you think about this creativity and logic? Because I think there's a lot of logic in play now through programmatic advertising and things like that as algorithms uh, that determine so many things. Is there a space for creativity in all of this? Um, yeah, but before I answer your question, I wanted to uh, go back uh, to, uh, to something that Art uh, referenced to. Um, and um, he referenced to influences. And Recently, I came across a, a term, genuine influencers, um, which made me laugh a little bit because um, that it kind of inferred that, uh, well, it was the time uh, to, for the influencers that were really genuine and, you know, uh, believed in the product and tested the product that they, um, that they were involved with. Um, and I, so I had to laugh because that's the whole dichotomy, correct? Right? People are following people based upon... Um, cuteness or based upon a nice video or whatever they done and not necessarily based upon um, yeah, the, the, the actual um, vetting of the message or the person itself. And in terms of creativity and logic, um, yeah, I think definitely if it's being used to, um, to provide in, 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 in the sense of contextual. And I think um, personal, there's nothing wrong with personalization. Um, provided that uh, ultimately the uh, the debate between the individual and, and the company or the other party is clear uh, about the value equation. And that the, the value equation is very simple. It's like, if you want this for free, being it content or whatever, obviously we want something from you. And in this particular case, that is data. Um, but that has never been a really open debate and to give the choice now it starts to, you're starting to get the choice whether you want to be tracked, yes or no, right? So, um, um, but personalization, I think, is good because it will allow for the right amount of contextualization. And that's where I think technology and creativity can meet. It used to be that uh, with advertising and communication, largely it was uh, sort of more your immediate uh, lookout. Uh, you sort of advertise for your your local market. Now with the internet uh, and everything so wide and global, uh, do you need to shift the way you think as a creative person? Have, as a creative uh, person, um, yeah, that's interesting. You know, in my in my last few years at at, at Denso, where um, of course uh, a lot of the um, the convergence between technology and creativity uh, was 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 discussed and was being operated on. Um, I, I had very interesting discussions with, uh, within the company, especially uh, with what we call the creative department, um, which I always find a little bit of an oxymoron, correct? Because in an agency, you are supposed to be creative as, as, as a whole. Um, but we had discussions about, uh, you, know, you know, what does creativity constitute of? Um, and um, I, I always, in those cases, get transported back to my days in China, where I had two posters hanging in my office. One was of Bill Burnback, who said, 
creativity is the best a business can employ. And he said that in the 60s. And by the way, Bill Burnberg was one of the um, it was like inspirations for Mad Men. But he said creativity. He didn't say advertising. Advertising just happened to be the prevalent form at that moment in which you would communicate, build a brand. And then the other poster was uh, white cat, black cat, I don't care what color the cat is, as long as it catches mice. And I like to think that we are always in the business of catching mice. And in a world where you can be everywhere instantaneously, on for 24 seven, and where everything is media, and where connections and commerce can be made at the same time as against the sequential. That's how you practice creativity in a very different way. And that's where as a creative person, um, you need to be interested to, for instance, to do 3000 different iteration of a really big idea because then it can be served up in the right context, provided you have the right data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are very interesting discussions that we had uh, with, with, with creative people because, you know, um, in there, and some of them would say, like, would jump on it and says, yes, I can have bigger impact um, of that idea. Uh, and others would say, it's like, no, 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 no. It's, I've, I've conceived this as this 30 second, 30 second, 60 second movie. Um, and that's form thinking in my, in my view. So do you need to have a different sort of head on your shoulders as a creative these days? The curiosity is, for me, is, is one of the foundations for creativity. If you, um, and I think you should be, if the world shifts and, you know, COVID, of course, puts it on steroid, but that already was happening before. Uh, and the reason why we at Unventures talk about the adaptive economy is because the irony is that there is a lot of technology nowadays out there like machine learning, AI, and all that type of stuff, which will make a lot of jobs, as we know them, obsolete. And we, I don't mean warehousing. We all go into accountancy and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we have a, a, glow, a growing world population. These things are kind of counter. So it's, it's logical that we all need to go and find new ways to provide value. And the glass half empty on that is to say, Oh, you know, bloody technology and we're all being obsolete. Or to say is like, hey, we now can do something really different and meaningful with our talent. And what is it that our passion points are? What is it that we would like to do? And how can we use um, this, this, this new world um, to do something meaningful and provide different ways of, of value? Art, for you, do you see um, the, the scene changing to an extent that you have to do things differently now? Just looking at the Singapore context, in the 90s, if you can sell 3,000 CDs of your album uh, locally, just in the Singapore market, you generally, if, you, know, if you, you don't overspend on your recording budget, you could get returns for your profit uh, of your investment. Uh, you get your money back and then you can roll in to make your next album and you make money through royalties and radio play and live gigs through Compass. Uh, collecting on, on, on your behalf and all that. But 3,000 streaming of your album on Spotify is nothing near uh, that in, in terms of the numbers. You know, one, one stream of a song is 0 0.058 cents, not even one cent. So, you know, even you even have international songwriters complaining that they'll make more money busking. But it's a catch-22. You, you, you need to be there because that's the platform among other, other digital platforms. At the same time, you're not really making any returns from it because you're just adding on to their numbers to their advantage. Is the system gaming the artist? Well, I, well, I, well, they, well, they say they're trying to they play. When they, obviously, there are artists that, you know, with one billion streaming, they, they see a bit of money in there. But you know, with, with that kind of uh, numbers, you they pump in a lot of money for advertising as well. It's like just buying, mm. like imagine you have a book and you want to put it on, on a local bookshop, and this local bookshop will charge you to have your book on display, and the front front door at the front door, you know, so that people when they walk in they see. Even with CDs, before you pay to have your CDs in the front rack. So it's the same with Spotify and all these digital players, where you still have to pay up a bit uh, or, or spend money on advertising to have your stuff up front. So, you know, I mean, in the music business, sometimes the, the promotion budget is a lot, lot more than the recording budget. So when you see people like Beyonce and all these people, Jay-Z, 
getting a lot of, of, of streaming is a lot of money being pumped in just to kind of make them visible. And, you know, and, and record labels will bet on winning horses because the winning horses will be the one bringing back the money to reinvest in the new, new acts. And I mean, that's always been the model. If you are an international act, it's maybe you, you have a better chance of, you know, especially if you sing in English. Or if your market is huge like China. Like if your market is just Singapore, then you have a problem because obviously there's the population size. And if you want to do regional languages, like for example, Malay, then you have to look at Malaysia or Indonesia, but they themselves also have their own nuances. They have their own, what I call, you know, the, the uh, iron batik curtains, you know, they have, they have also like things that kind of stop. They have restrictions other, in place as well, right? Yeah, not, conditions yeah, yeah, conditions, you know, that, that, yeah. that, and, and also some, some of these markets are very nationalistic. Like they, they mm. it's not that they don't like other acts, but they would prefer their own because of, I don't know, their, their own personal feelings to their, their own region, their own homegrown acts. Do we have any nationalistic uh, fervor for our artists? <laughs> or do we just look to the West and other markets and disregard local artists? I mean, to be fair, there, there, are, there are people who, who listen to Made in Singapore music. I mean, even from the 60s, you know, we have people like uh, The Quest, you know, have fan base, the Cyclones, and then... Yeah, but that was uh, a different time. That was a time before social media. You didn't have yeah, a global yeah. understanding. So you only have that, right? Yeah. I so, mean, to be fair, there, there are like acts like Gentle Bones that are doing rather well, you know. True. But again, but they, only they know where their listeners are coming from. Because judging from the population size of Singapore, it's, it's very hard to gauge that the huge numbers come from just one market. Yeah. So again, you have to be maybe relevant to the international world maybe. So, so this would... See, if a, a young Malay person who's conversant in English were given a choice, do you want to record in English or Malay, for example, they may prefer to record in English because it reaches out to a wider audience. You know, which means... On, on the other hand, it's like the loss of usage of local languages. So which has also been a, a concern within the Malay community where the younger ones are losing their uh, usage of the Malay language outside the classroom. So, and, and, and then this trails down to consumption of Malay publications like Berita Harian, radio, TV, and all that. So it's the Americanization of the environment culture. is right? Is the environment right here for... For creativity or is it still very focused on on logic i mean if you look at the recent yale and us uh, situation where it's been uh, they're going to disband that whole thing um what what does that say what sort of signals uh, is that sending out? i mean michelle for you as a student uh, mm. in that uh, environment uh, what are your thoughts about that okay so the whole issue with the NUS, uh, closing of your NUS, a big concern was that this was a closure of the first liberal arts college in Singapore. And I have to admit that, okay, we've given a lot of attention to the sciences, but that doesn't inherently take away from the creativity of the people in the sciences. I feel that um, Singapore, in terms of its innovations in technology is creative in their own right. I mean, we came up with the thumb drive, we came up with new water. So I think we are creative in our own rights, but just not in the creative arts. And the closure of the Liberal Arts College is a little concerning if you think about the fact that the new foreign investments that are coming in will be coming in from media companies like maybe like Netflix, uh, or Warner Brothers and the new gaming companies. These are people who, and, and with Singapore, our only resources being our brilliant minds that we can give them. Um, the closing of the Liberal Arts College might not be a very good signal to be putting out at the moment because um, you would need the, the brains that are tuned to this kind of creative thinking in that kind of field so that you can attract these investments. and. On the, at the, on the same note, I feel that, um, at least from my understanding, liberal arts 
it teaches you how to, it focuses on the humanities, the social sciences. It also focuses on teaching you how to articulate and express your views, be it through um, a painting, through music, through your words. So these, I feel that um, these uh, students who are able to be exposed to this kind of thinking and um, be used to expressing their views will also be the ones that will protect us against some unsavory practices that um, these new media companies who are sweeping the nation will bring with them. So one example I'm sure you've known about is the uh, fret culture in gaming industry, in the gaming industry. So um, they very little respect for women. Uh, they talk about things like very weird practices like farting on each other during meetings. Yeah, so these odd practices. I think that students who are educated in the liberal arts would have that ability to speak out and stand up for themselves when it comes to these kind of practices. You know, they will have that courage to say, hey, no, 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 this is wrong. And yeah, that's why I think that, you know, closing of the liberal arts college Maybe not the right step, but I would love to see um, liberal arts being a bigger part of the education system. Yeah. But anyway, part of the reasons for the, the liberal arts, I mean, the Yale and US closure is also funding. Is it? So do people see value in creativity? I mean, if they're not funding it, isn't that uh, an indicator that, well, we don't, we don't think much of this anyway? The Singapore government gets a really bad rep for um, not promoting the creative arts. They say, oh, you know, you're always like, um, telling us that we should do the sciences but you're not doing enough for the creative arts but um, I feel that I just came out from junior college and I, I remember my secondary school education quite well and I know that there isn't really a demand from both parents and students for creative arts and I can understand why the creative arts scene in Singapore isn't doing that well because there isn't an infrastructure um, to support it Yes, the government can do a lot of things to help out, but uh, the if the demand is not there... There's no emphasis for creativity. It, is, it isn't high on the priority list. Yeah, I don't think it's high for the priority list because um, in, in any, if I go into any industry, there are two factors that probably um, helps in my, in my decision in going to an industry. The first one would be reward, right? whether I can be paid well enough to do well in Singapore. I don't want to just survive in Singapore. I want to do well. Um, and whether there is passion for me to go into that. So maybe if lawyers, they, they must have a natural passion, even if they don't. But I'm sure some most lawyers have a natural passion for the subject. And in Singapore, the infrastructure is there for people who are in uh, places like studies, like economies, uh, economics, the law, math, science, they, the know-how is there for them to succeed. You can easily find um, the education that you need, the support that you need in terms of ASTAR and everything for you to succeed as a lawyer, as a, as a scientist. But as a creative, um, the reward, maybe not there. The passion, I'm sure that all artists have a passion and I am passionate about my art, but there isn't the demand that there's the people willing to look at it. So it is extremely difficult to make it big as a creative in Singapore. I think what uh, Michelle is saying is the, in, the industry infrastructure, like as lawyers, you have you know, the progression, you go to law school and then yes. you end up right. doing your apprenticeship or you, you, know, uh, you, uh, you end up working in a law firm and all that. Like being in the, in, in, in the real world, in the entertainment, you have the management companies, you have your talent development department, you have a &R of your record label, and a lot of these are, are kind of missing components within our local industry. So you, you kind of survive a lot of the, well, from the music world locally, they, they kind of survive on their own, like very ad hoc. You know, you do your gigs, you put out your own stuff online, uh, maybe you print your CDs or vinyl, but it's, it's not an industry with all the right things in, you know, like when you want, the first thing you want to do when you, you start your music career is to find a, a manager. Could be your cousin, could be your brother or sister who believes in your music. And then obviously it, when it, it involves making money for the, for the artist, for the band. And you know, how do you monetize that to begin with? And then from there, how do you approach a record label or how do you form your own independent label and, and stuff like that? 
So I think it's, it's the industry infrastructure. I mean, we have a lot of funding with with National Arts Council. There's a lot. You can, you, can, you can ask for funding to, to start your own music, I mean, to, to record your own album and all that. But it's just giving fish instead of teaching the person how to fish. So you just keep giving just money, what, whoever needs it, okay, you get your funding and you are happy with it. Um, but you know we don't have that 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 industry infra infrastructure as see we, we're about 5.5 million people right now plus minus right so that's about the same size as the republic of ireland and also sweden but comparatively these other two countries have very very strong um music industry and and their work goes out to the rest of i mean like sweden is the is a hit making factory right now with all the record produ producers uh, you know, working with American acts. Kind of you, you, you've seen the business from 80s, 90s. I, I started in the 90s and all that. So and we know when we backtrack, the industry has only been a start-stop with the banning of rock and roll in 19, 1st of January 1970, when Singapore bans rock and roll on radio, jukebox, stop tea dancers, band got disband disbanded because of all that. So there was all this start and stop. And then in the 80s, you try to pick up again with Class X album and the Warner Music. And then it kind of like went quiet again. And then 90s with Pony Canada, it picked up again. So this has been a pattern with the Singapore music industry, uh, I've, I, what I've been seeing all, the, all these years. And, and so we end up having brain drain where some of the very good composers end up leaving Singapore, changing citizenship because it's more advantageous for them to be in a citizen of that country. For, like in the Malay music world, a lot of the, the producers, composers, I can think of at least 10 important players in the industry who were born in Singapore but moved up and changed citizenship to be Malaysians because it gives them more advantage. And, you know, obviously it's a reach, reaching out to a wider market, you know, about 30 million people as compared to 700,000 people from the Malay market. I mean, for us to cross over to Indonesia with 270 million people, is, it obviously is a bonus, but it's a lot harder to get through as compared to getting into Malaysia. There are factors of uh, economic viability, profitability, but in, in the global scheme of things, um, should where you come from matter? I mean, uh, Dick, what do you think uh, in, in that regard? I mean, does does it matter where you hail um, from? I just wanted to pick up on, on uh, what the previous two speakers said. Remember uh, when Singapore turned 50, uh, Kanan, you had a series of op uh, <laughs> articles and I, I wrote one where I said that yeah. Singapore needs an extra, extra C. Yeah, besides mm. the condo credit cards and all, it needs to be a sea of chaos or creativity. Uh, because in order for creativity to, to thrive, there needs to be a, uh, an element of organicness being allowed. And organicness will involve a little bit of, you know, chaos, a little bit of stuff that has not been defined. And I think, of course, that is the big, that's the big uh, tension point. It's like, you know, um, the country has come become very big and successful by, by visioning, defining and executing on, on, on very, very good plans. But then, you know, in order to go to the next level, which really is an idea led economy, yeah, a creativity led economy that requires a different dynamics. And I think that's, uh, that old Pete that I wrote a couple of years ago is still very valid. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, to Michelle's points is like at the moment that there's, there's more, emphasis on attracting big multinationals and making sure that they headquarter here as against to connecting that perhaps with then an equivalent or matching efforts to you know to to really develop the local creative uh, spirit um, and i would not just say creative sector but local creative spirit um you know i i come i, I was i'm originally from holland and so i yeah that's a very different different country where liberal arts are celebrated and where there definitely is a lot of chaos at times, sometimes even too much for my liking. Um, so I, I'm, I'm able to, 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 see, to see all the, all the differences. And I've, I've lived in China, I've lived in Korea, Japan, everywhere. So that was, I've, I've had the benefit of, 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 of seeing different countries, how they go about it. And, and you know, the, the, the differences between being very liberal or being very controlled and, and what that does. Um, so, but to your point about, uh, should it matter where you come from? Um, the beauty uh, to my earlier point at the beginning of the, the session is that 
technology has globalized a lot of things and it has provided a lot of access. Yes, to arts commons, money still rules. But at the same time, there is the access, you can gain the algorithm it, without money, you can um, stand out. Um, at least you have access to, uh, to a global audience. Um, so in a way, it, it, it doesn't matter where you come from. Um, and at the same time, obviously, if you have if you come from a country with a large home base, uh, large population, you have a huge home base that you can tap into. You know, that that dynamic is still very valid. Some years ago, when I had a column at the new, the, the new paper, I did write about like Singapore's Renaissance and comparatively, like during the Renaissance period in Europe, there was a lot of chaos, you know, a lot of murders. Uh, scandals and lot, but they produce a lot of great art, you know, at that period. As comparatively, comparatively to, to 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 Switzerland, that was very peaceful. They only produced the cuckoo clock, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the comparatively, yeah. So yes, I mean, I agree with Dick saying that yeah, you need you need that chaos thing, you know, to 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 create that. And if you look at the big markets, it's always that, you know, look at Indonesia, why there's so much creativity in terms of the painting world, in terms of the music world, it's all that, you know, there's, a bit, there's chaos, there's um, all this, you know, and also traditional art and all to influence, uh, to produce what's their current contemporary work right now. Like, why not? Mm. Sorry. Karen, should... Karen, Karen. To like Dick's point, he said that, you know, you have the means to, to go, uh, promote yourself online because of how uh, pervasive the digital world is. And, and I find that that's, um, that's something that's very true. As well. Okay, so I'm very uh, into TikTok. I, I love TikTok. I spend like eight hours on TikTok a day. My day is sucked into that, uh, that app. And I've realized that um, it is a new platform for um, songwriters or creatives to go viral. I've seen some of the TikTok songs that have gone viral on the Billboard 100s. I've seen creators who manage to fund themselves and their livelihood because they can't do it in their own country. They get they garner a worldwide audience to do so. It's so easy to go viral on TikTok that 100,000 views is honestly quite normal. And yeah, I think that that what it wouldn't matter okay yes it still matters that the dynamic of you know um being connected to your local audience that still matters but in a sense you have the means to go uh, to to access an even larger audience than you would have been many many years ago and i think that's that's an amazing um an, an amazing uh, development yeah. yeah besides tiktok you know there's an there's a uh a service called Wattpad, and Wattpad is a digital platform, a literary yeah, platform, right. especially for for uh, women and femzy. And uh, you know, one of the agencies that I'm, one of the companies that I'm involved with in Culture Group, um, you know, represents them in APAC, and and so I, I've got quite a bit of insight into it. And if you see that that platform is amazing, you know, for us, for you to have your voice. Now, I think the interesting part about all these platforms is that it allows you, but it also, um, you need to have a voice in order to stand out. And I think that is, um, that is something that you know, not, doesn't come very, uh, very natural to a lot of people. And perhaps in the context of what we're just been discussing, certain countries, yeah, that would be a little bit more difficult for people to stand out and 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 to have their voice without something in the back saying like, okay, uh, am I uh, am I doing the right thing here? Or you know, forget about shyness, but you know whether the, whether it is from a societal and political context being allowed, whether you know there's constraints that we are subconsciously governed by. You think um, you know with all this. Uh, these platforms, right? A lot of them are driven by algorithms. Uh, they will start feeding you things that, uh, based on your viewing habits, wouldn't that sort of take away from the fact that there's so much out there beyond what you're constantly looking at, which you could tap into but don't get a chance to do so? So it's doing a disservice, and it, to some extent, it is also manipulating the whole process where. Creativity is forced into certain sort of silos and pushed through. 
to benefit their bottom line at the end of the day. Because I, I still feel the systems game, uh, whatever else is going on out there. Uh, but doesn't that just kill creativity if you are forced to funnel all your efforts into finding just these few ways of putting up content because it has the greatest appeal according to the system? Well, that's a much deeper discussion, correct? Because that is like, what do we value? What do we, uh, what do we reward? And um, we reward big numbers. And we reward uh, uh, the person that has the biggest muscle, the biggest voice, um, the, the, the most number of followers. Um, so I think that goes much wider than just creativity and all that. It goes in terms of, you know, what do we, what do we uh, value as a society? Um, uh, do, we, do we value individuality, being able to speak out, uh, everybody, allow everybody to have a voice? Or do we say, no, 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 we're only going to follow that one that, you know, that mm -hmm. just has the biggest numbers? I think like with the sheer amount of uh, differences in creativity online, right? Everyone has their unique niche audience. You know, there are micro influencers with maybe like 4,000 followers. It might not be much, but it's enough for them. And these, these little communities are out there for people to discover. Yes, I understand that the algorithm, the TikTok algorithm especially, it's really strong. Um, Instagram as well, so, so is Facebook. But I do feel that when someone is trying to discover something new and not... Um, and not just following the algorithm, that there, there is the means to go and find these little niche communities, whether it be on Reddit, on TikTok, yeah. Uh, there's a question here uh, about this, uh, this topic about uh, creative conscious choices. How do we reward creativity versus just influencing people? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, obviously, if the right amount of the right creativity or yeah the right, the right creativity will evoke something now will it evoke um, a reaction or will it evoke a number of users and followers um, i think you know on the one hand the question to the answer to that question is quite individual you know it's like what does it do to you as an individual um, um, i think um, engagement is probably a much better um, uh, measure than uh, number of views. Yeah, um, and so that's that's my personal um, view on it. But um, yeah, as I said earlier, you know, at the moment, um, the the influences that have bigger numbers than a create than a person that has arguably bigger creativity, uh, that influences will get the advertising dollars. Uh, but then that is success measured in money. Yeah. So one way would be to not just listen to art, perform a song on Instagram, but to go out there and buy his album, right? Uh, show, show your support, put your money where, where your ears are, where your eyes are, and support with the actual cash. At the end of the day, that's what you want to see, right? A thriving transaction that takes place between the consumer and the performer uh, or the advertiser. Uh, you, you want to move things, move things along. Absolutely. And the nice thing about, I would, I would call now the metaverse, for instance, that we're operating in, um, is that you, that engagement and that monetization can happen at the same time. So, you know, when Travis Scott did a, did a, did an, uh, a concert the other day, um, he didn't fill a stadium of 80,000 people. He filled the web with eight, was it 80 million people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, connected to that was the opportunity to buy digital merchandise. And, you know, I'm still struggling with that. So sometimes it's like, you know, how to dress up your avatar or how to, how to buy the digital Nikes that Travis was wearing and, and pay whatever dollars for that and to have your unique number uh, on that. Um, but that's what that's what happening, and that's yeah, you, that's engagement. Now, arguably, that's also a whole money machine that's behind it. But yeah, it, it does it does it is about how to maximize the monetization of creativity.
to me, I do this when I when I share my art online, when I share my bleach jackets, uh, or when I share the, the little paintings that I do here and there. If nobody buys it, I'm actually perfectly okay with it because I just want to share, to get my work out there, you know, so that to see people who might be interested in this or to find people who are like-minded that, you know, can appreciate my art style. So when it comes to, of course, the, the monetization is, is definitely important in sustainability, but um, for a more moral, uh, morale standpoint, I think when someone comments like, oh my God, I like, I like what you're doing. It, it gives you much more life and much more happiness when it, uh, as compared to like hounding yourself with, oh my God, can I sell this? Can I, if I paint it this way, will I sell it this way? Yeah. Uh, and Dick, do you have any uh, suggestions or tips for a newbie artist like Michelle trying to break in uh, the scene? Well, I mean, in from 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 musician's point of view, you have to just have to be honest to yourself. I mean, just the the yourself, your 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 inner self, you know, the core person that you are. That one, you know, whatever happens to the industry, and the industry will always change. You know, nobody anticipated MP3 30 years ago, right? And now they're talking about uh, blockchain technology for music. I don't know what's what's next. You know, something else will happen again in some years to come, but. It hasn't changed the music, you know. I mean, if you if you if you are true to your art, true to yourself, I think whatever happens around you, you just adapt accordingly. And that is mainly the, the you know the the how to put the end product out there. But you as an artist, you know what satisfy you, what makes you move when you wake up in the morning, and makes you happy when you sleep. I think that's important uh, in this madness that we're going through now with you know with the the COVID thing and. You know, acts can't perform. I mean, there's so many frustrated musicians who are just waiting to perform out there, you know. Uh, I mean, we have, luckily, we, you know, this is a perfect storm. Without the digital technology, imagine COVID without, without broadband. We go crazy, <laughs> right? So we, 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 we kind of adapt, you know, human beings are, are adaptable creatures. So, yeah, but I think as long as you are true to yourself and you know you you, you and you and, and 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 art is all about communication. You can communicate to someone else. Uh, like an uh, example for like I told my friend, there are painters in Bali who are who are, are are farmers. Their day job are just planting rice, but they do great traditional art and and they are artists themselves. So. You know, in obviously in the modern context, can you pay your bills with your art and all that? Th those things are changing again as well. You know, it's always evolving, and and at the end of the day, it's like, can you be happy being who you are? If you're not, then do something else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, can I sorry? Can I just ask you based on on what you just said about uh, being able to continue with what you do, COVID and what's happened? How many artists do you think have given up? Musicians have given up and. I'm forced to try and look for other things to do. I I have no no numbers, but hearing so, but stuff across your, yeah. across the border in Malaysia, you know, people are selling musical instruments just to make it, just to to put food on the table. Yeah, you know, okay. at that, so that, that 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 state because you know, especially those who have, you know, uh, families to feed and 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 you know, they have to bills to pay, their housing loan, what whatever, you know. So it's it's desperate in some situation. Um, but again, I, I think I spoke to you about the, the, the strength of a local market. So now you see, you look at how local promoters who used to bring in all these acts from outside to perform in Singapore are now not able to do that. Whereas in places like Indonesia or Malaysia or Thailand, the local promoters could tap into the local homegrown market because it has always been one of the stronger components of the local industry. Because that's how the you know the local acts were touring, performing, monetizing their work and all that. Whereas in Singapore, it's always been, we've always been a, a, a hall for rent, you know, Esplanade, you know, all the big acts, stadium and all that. You know, we the, the the big the bulk of the money is from foreign acts performing in Singapore, right? So how do you change that and how do you use this current situation to kind of shift a bit of the balance where you can actually tapping into your homegrown market now that I mean there's so many talented musicians out there young mid-career people you know I see it all the time if you look, if you go to Peninsula right now Peninsula shopping center at the basement 
there is more music shops now as compared to before, which means there is a market where people are still buying musical instruments, learning instruments, you know, but how do you consolidate all that and that becomes a very strong energy as an industry? And, and that becomes an output for us but to, to, to speak to the rest of the world because, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of young creative people who just don't want Singapore to be seen as uh, a financial center, uh, a banking you know, country for, for private banks and all that. You know, they, they want to be recognized. Like, you know, if you, if you go to a place like Jamaica, they go like, ah, reggae music, yeah, Jamaica. You know, automatically, there is a sort of branding. The, the irony of the digital economy is that everything gets commoditized at lightning speed. Um, and therefore, from, from my point of view, creativity and craft are really the unique assets that, that, will, that will be very valuable going forward. Uh, that's one. The other part is, um, and I have to reference Bill Birnbeck again, who said, you know, a, a bad product, uh, advertising for a bad product will make it feel faster. Um, <laughs> and um, I think it's true. You know, that, that's number two. Number three, what people are craving for at, in this junction, in this digital world, you know, where everything gets commoditized and where you get this big echo chamber. People are looking for leadership, and leadership comes in various forms. Leadership comes in uh, having an opinion, understanding the context in which you operate, having a perspective on that, um, and then go out with a conviction and bring that in a user experience that resonates. You know, at, at Unventures, we use that model as a, as a spine, we, to create the spine of yourself. Um, and that will produce a unique voice. There are so many platforms. How can you decide which one is, is right? The glass half full is, we have so many platforms. If you know how to find your voice, you can go out there. Now, the expectation in which you go out there, that's an interesting one. If you expect, as Michelle said, you know, that everybody will pay a lot of money for their, for their art instantly, then you might, might be disappointed. But if, the, if you, your expectation is no, I want to be heard. I want to. I put my voice out there for anybody who wants to be heard. And if that is a relevant message, being it in what kind of form it, it will come, you know, whether it's in a painting, whether it's in music, whether it's in advertising or a product or a service, and and it resonates, yeah, then um, you will also be relevant because let's let's face it as well. Now we need to find relevance. Uh, to each other and, and, and things that, that resonate, have relevance and have the opportunity to monetize. Okay, great. Uh, Mark, Michelle and uh, Dick, thank you for all of that. Um, I think, uh, Dick, your point on leadership is something to look towards. You know? If you're doing something, can you be a leader in this? Can you do it to a fashion that will appeal to people because of what it is? and not because of the likes, because I think the likes and so on and so forth, if you don't continue to produce good stuff, you fall off. If you're relying on your looks, how long will that last before that drops off too? There will always be some new fresh face waiting uh, to take you. Kana, it lasted me quite yeah. a bit actually, you know, in terms of the looks department. Looks are serious. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must have a certain look that people like. <laughs> No, see, for, for, yeah, for singers... You look younger for, than most people your no, age Importantly, do, so. for singers, you must keep your teeth. If you have no teeth, you can't sing, uh, my friend. Yes, <laughs> yes. So a good dentist is important for yeah. you. <laughs> Oral hygiene. Okay, hey, great. Thanks uh, so much for adding to all of this. Um, may the creativity continue because I, I hope there will still be avenues for pockets of creativity to, 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 to percolate and grow and develop and catch a few imaginations and and spark some creativity, further creativity along the way. Meanwhile, logic will still be there. Uh, we'll have to learn to live in and around it and maybe uh, twine its way through the logic and add a bit more life and color into it. But thanks for...